How safe burial practices helped contain the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. How eating fish could help ease rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. And Apple's iPhone celebrates 10 years on the market, with over 1 billion sold. Africa Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu. You are in for Vincent McCurry. This is Africa 54. The widows of four of nine men executed by Nigeria's military regime in 1995 have filed a civil lawsuit seeking unspecified compensation and an apology for Royal Dutch Shell for alleged complicity in a military crackdown. According to a writ filed in a court in The Hague, the four widows allege that Shell provided support to the military in the crackdown that ultimately led to the executions of the men known as the Ogoni Nine. Shell, the largest oil producer in Nigeria, has repeatedly denied any involvement in the executions or the government's response to the unrest. The Nigerian military cracked down heavily on local position to oil production by a Shell joint venture in the Niger Delta in the early 1990s. In recent years, a number of groups have pursued cases against Shell in courts in the United Kingdom, the United States and the Netherlands over claims related to oil spills and environmental damage, claiming they cannot get a fair hearing in Nigeria. A Cameroonian woman has been honored for her unrelenting efforts to combat modern slavery, her groundbreaking work in identifying key migration trends to prevent trafficking of Cameroonians in the Middle East, and her dedication to ensuring survivors have legal support and access to comprehensive reintegration assistance. Sister Vanaja Jaspin's efforts were recognized on Tuesday at a ceremony at the U.S. Department of State. Human tra trafficking in our region is very rampant. Most of our girls, our children, our women are trafficked domestically, internationally, for sex exploitation, labor exploitation, to so many other things in the name of uh, uh, giving some allowance. But through our uh, educational program and our sensitization with all this, we made the people to realize that it is a grass human rights violation and it is the breach of one's fundamental rights. During the ceremony, the U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson noted human trafficking remains one of the most tragic human rights issues of our time, threatening public safety and national security. A new study by the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies estimates that safe burial practices may have helped prevent the transmission of thousands of cases of Ebola during the epidemic in West Africa between 2013 and 2016. In 2014, BOA accompanied a local burial team in Marigbe County, one of the worst affected areas in Liberia, using those practices. As Benno Mochla reports at the time, more than 200 such burials had taken place there without a single team member becoming infected. A woman died. Her brother is heartbroken. A local burial team is getting ready to remove the body from the village in the Robertsfield community near Liberia's International Airport. Emmanuel N.B. Flomo, the man with a little camera, is the head of the team. Removing dead bodies infected with Ebola is a risky job. Filming it is a difficult one. You can't move quickly in a suit like these men are wearing. The gear needs to be covered and later disinfected, like everything else around here. The undertakers start with a hearse and then take on the woman's house. We have to disinfect everything that we know mistakenly get in contact with him because he's not supposed to touch anything in there. So, but I mean, it's crazy, like all the people, like the guys like around us, like they have no, they have no protection at all. It's the problem that we got in Liberia. Most people are, are, are they are not believing that the virus is real. The young woman lived in this tiny hut with just a bed, some cooking pots, some firewood, she lies on a mattress on the floor and is covered by clothes. Now he's 
she's a baby mother and the child is just three months old. So I don't know if the family will still be uh, refusing for them to take the baby too for, for treatment because I land a child who is not eating right now. After disinfecting the body, the undertakers are preparing themselves to put the body into the body bag. And this point is the, is the risky part. So it's, it's only advisable to touch the body one time. Mm -hmm. And that is by taking the body from the ground straight into the body bag. That's the only type of guys that want to get in contact with the body. The infection around this body, I would say, is 100%. While the men are disinfecting themselves, the father shouts at them. The husband can only watch how the undertakers are carrying his dead wife away. The burial team takes the body to a nearby village. The undertakers bury the body far into the bush. After more than 200 burials since the Ebola outbreak in their area, none of the team has gotten sick. But their job not only comes with a health risk, it's also an emotional strain. Out of respect for the dead woman and her family, they don't want me to film how they have to put the body into the ground. The men say they are not scared, they need to do it, because if they didn't, more of their people would get infected and die. Benno Möchler, VOA News, Margibi County, Liberia. The U.S. is boosting the security levels for all foreign airlines flying into American airports, but it is not for now expanding a ban on carry-on laptop computers. Passengers can expect more screening, closer examination of personal electronic devices, more security around planes and terminals, and dogs trained to sniff out bombs and chemicals. U.S. Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly says the new measures will be phased in over the next few months. Our enemies are constantly working to find new methods for, for disguising explosives, recruiting insiders, and hijacking aircraft. I've made a point to talk with everyone I can about securing aviation. I've met with our international partners. I've met with our industry leaders. I've met with our private sector stakeholders. My conclusion is this. It is time that we raise the global baseline of aviation security. Laptop computers were forbidden on planes coming from eight African and Middle Eastern airports in March after intelligence that Islamic State was seeking to put a bomb inside one. The new security measures will affect 280 airports in 105 countries. About 325,000 people flying from those airports to the U.S. every day. Foreign airlines are being given 120 days to comply with the new measures and 21 days to boost screening of electronic devices. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has met with top Qatari and Kuwaiti officials to try to help broker an end to the escalating standoff between Qatar and its Gulf neighbors. Tillerson says he is encouraging dialogue for while President Donald Trump sharply criticizes Qatar for funding terrorism. VOA diplomatic correspondent Cindy Sain reports. Recently back from his first trip abroad to Saudi Arabia last month, President Donald Trump weighed in on the Qatar crisis. The nation of Qatar, unfortunately, has historically been a funder of terrorism at a very high level. And in the wake of that conference, nations came together and spoke to me about confronting Qatar over its behavior. On June 5th, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Egypt, and others severed diplomatic ties and instituted a land, air, and sea blockade of Qatar. Among their complaints, Qatar's close ties to Iran, which promises to help weather the blockade. The U.S. has an air base in Qatar, using it for missions against Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said in a statement it would be very difficult for Qatar to meet a list of 13 demands from the Saudi-led group, but there is room for dialogue. Our role has been to encourage the parties to get their issues on the table, clearly articulated, so that those issues can be addressed and some resolution process uh, can get underway to bring this to a conclusion. Veteran U.S. diplomat Alan Keyswetter told VOA Tillerson and Trump have a different emphasis in this conflict. The secretary's stance has been one of a, of a diplomat, of a negotiator. 
he's known the Qataris for decades. He's known the other players for decades. And he thinks there's a possibility of working this out. State Department spokesperson Heather Nauert said the U.S. will try to facilitate talks, but it is up to the Gulf countries themselves to work out their disagreements. Cindy Sane, VOA News, the State Department. A top-ranking Australian cardinal finds himself embroiled in controversy. George Pell is denying accusations by authorities in his country of sexually based crimes. Cardinal Pell, who serves as chief financial advisor to Pope Francis, was ordered to appear in a Melbourne court on July 18th for a hearing on charges of historic sexual offences. He maintained his innocence during a press conference Thursday in the Vatican City. Uh, these matters have been under investigation uh, now for two years. There have been leaks to the media. There have been, there's been relentless character assassination. A relentless character assassination. And for more than a month, claims that a, a decision on whether to lay charges um, was imminent. I'm looking forward, finally, to having my day in court. Cardinal Pell says he has been granted leave of absence by Pope Francis to address his situation. Australian police have not provided details of the allegations against the cardinal beyond saying there are multiple complainants linked to the charges. Pell is the highest-ranking Catholic official to face charges of sexual abuse. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, how a change in diet could help ease the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. Stay with us. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. It's time for our health report, and here is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu with a look at rheumatoid arthritis. Lino. A new study has found that frequent fish consumption is associated with lower disease activity in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. In the study conducted from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, Researchers examined data from 176 patients from the ESCAPE RA cohort study. They found that individuals with rheumatoid arthritis who consumed fish two times a week or more had lower disease activity, such as swollen tender joint counts, along with other assessments, in comparison with those who ate fish never to less than once a month. They say this suggests that fish consumption may lower inflammation related to rheumatoid arthritis disease activity. The results are published in the journal Arthritis Care and Research. Rheumatoid arthritis is one of many different types of arthritis and other musculoskeletal conditions which have the common issue of causing pain and physical disability. Joining us live via Skype from Truro, United Kingdom, for more on the subject is Professor Anthony Wolfe with the Bone and Joint Research Group Knowledge Spa in Royal Cornwall Hospital, Truro. Professor Wolfe, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. Hello. First of all, there was this research about a diet on rheumatoid arthritis. Could you just give us your take on the, the impact of a diet on a rheumatoid arthritis and bone disease? Well, rheumatoid arthritis is a disease which causes pain and swelling in the joints, and that can also cause joint damage, and that's what leads to the long-term disability. And the inflammation which causes the pain and swelling 
it is due to various chemicals, and fish oils can affect those chemicals and reduce the pain and swelling. Unfortunately, they don't necessarily prevent the damage, and that's why any diet with increased amount of fish needs to be combined with other treatments to suppress the damaging parts of the arthritis. But it's a very interesting, good story, because people always want to know how they can help themselves. Yes. Yes, and when we look at arthritis in general, there seems to be a misunderstanding about this condition. A lot of people t tend to think that it happens to the elderly, but this is far from the truth. Absolutely. Rheumatoid arthritis, unfortunately, commonly starts in the 30s, uh, people of age 30 and onwards, and is a lifetime condition, and its impact becomes greatest when people get older, but it is something which affects younger people, and this is what gets forgotten. But the great thing is, over the last couple of decades, treatment has really advanced enormously. And now, if we see it early and treat it effectively, we can really try and control it and minimize that damage and disability. Let's talk about uh, bone and joint disease in general and how much of a burden it is to, to people in, globally. Well, as you said earlier, rheumatoid arthritis is just one of the forms of diseases which can affect joints. The more common type is osteoarthritis, which is often thought of as wear and tear. But also there's back pain, neck pain, and lots of other conditions which cause pain in your limbs or your neck and back and affect what you can physically do. And they're now found to be the greatest cause of disability worldwide, particularly back and neck pain. And that applies in countries like, Af you know, uh, continents like Africa as well, particularly if you look at those who've survived childhood conditions and infectious diseases, then the people who are getting older, this is really a growing problem, it is not being addressed adequately. Professor Wolf, before we finish quickly, what are some of the ways that people can pre prevent this to happen? Well, the main thing is to keep active and mobile, even if it hurts a bit, uh, avoid being overweight and have a good, balanced, healthy diet, which means adequate calcium, adequate vitamin D, and fish oil, which can help for the aches and pains, can also give you the vitamin D. And then if you do get a problem that causes you a limitation of what you're able to do, you should seek appropriate care, because now a lot can be done, and we don't need to have such a negative attitude that it's just aging and you should put up and shut up. Okay, Professor Wolf, thank you so much for joining us from uh, the United Kingdom. Thanks for the opportunity. And that was Professor Anthony Wolf. He is with the Bone and Joint Research Group Knowledge Spa in Royal Cornwall Hospital, Truro, United Kingdom. More than 70 people, mostly young children, have contracted measles in the United States. In the state of Minnesota, nearly all were unvaccinated. The same is true in every other country worldwide. That's why pediatricians and public health doctors want every child to get vaccinated against this virus. VOA's Kara Pearson takes a look at measles to find out why. Many people think measles is just another childhood disease, a rash, a fever, and it's gone. But top doctors say otherwise. Measles is not a trivial disease. If you have a measles outbreak, a proportion of people are going to have serious complications. Measles can cause permanent brain damage. It can leave a child blind or deaf. Measles also kills. In the pre-vaccine era, before we had the measles outbreaks, we had about 500 kids die every year of measles in the U.S. and 50,000 hospitalizations. Most people get better within two weeks, but the effects can linger. If a child acquires measles, even in a country like the United States, he can have complications of measles that can be deadly, like pneumonia, or he can have like a reduction in his immune functions. He can also have malnutrition for quite some time after. So the child becomes weaker and more susceptible to other infections. <laughs> All it takes is a sneeze or a cough to spread the virus in tiny droplets through the air. One person can affect up to 18 others. Each one of those people infects another dozen or so, and it spreads from there. 90% of those exposed will get the virus unless they've been vaccinated or have already had measles. The measles virus can linger on doorknobs, tables, any surface for up to two hours. 
touch it, and you're exposed. It's incredibly contagious, and the kids who get measles are really, really sick. I mean, it's, it's a pretty big deal to get measles. The first signs of measles are a runny nose, cough, and a fever followed by a red rash. Measles is not just a childhood disease. Adults can get it, too. The American Academy of Pediatrics has asked doctors to work with parents who are reluctant to get their children vaccinated. Dr. Hope Scott at Reston Town Center Pediatrics in Virginia says her practice will allow parents to set up a delayed vaccine schedule to a point. We'll work with them probably till about age two or so. And if they've not vaccinated by then and don't have a plan to do it and aren't acting on the plan, we will at that point ask them to leave the practice. The single best way to prevent measles is to get two doses of the measles vaccine. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends children get the first dose after their first birthday and the second when they are between four and six years old. The two doses together provide 97 percent protection against measles. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. That's our health report for today. To stay in fact, find me on Twitter at Lenore Mudu. Back to you, Esther. Thank you, Lenore. Be sure to watch Lenore Mudu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday on Africa 54. This year's World Food Prize at $250,000 was awarded to African Development Bank President Akinwomi Adesina. The former Nigerian Minister of Agriculture spoke to VOA's Maria Madiello from the bank's headquarters in Abidjan on the immense challenges he says are facing the continent. Akinwumi Adeshina is being recognized for improving the lives of millions of small farmers across the African continent, especially in Nigeria, where he was once the agriculture minister. Reforms he implemented increased food production by 21 million metric tons and led to and attracted $5.6 billion in private sector investments that earned him the reputation as the farmer's minister. Now president of the African Development Bank, Adeshina says he's honored that decades work is being recognized, but noted to VOA via Skype that Africa's challenges are immense. The big issue is how are we going to make sure that 250 million people that still do not have food in Africa get access to food. The other one is we've still got 58 million African children that are stunted today. And obviously stunted children today, they are going to lead to stunted economies tomorrow. He advocates for investing the money Africa spends on importing food into producing food. Our task ahead is to make sure that Africa fully feeds itself. That Africa conserves that $35 billion and Africa transforms its rural economies and create new hope and prosperity for a lot of the young people. For that to happen, agriculture has to be attractive to young people by making it a business, not just a way of life. He says he's worked hard to make agriculture cool for youngsters. We launched a, 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 an almost $800 million initiative last year that is called Enable Youth, which is to develop a new generation of young commercial farmers in both production, in logistics, in processing, in marketing, and all of that, all across the value chain. He's the sixth African to win what some consider the Nobel Prize for Food and Agriculture. He will accept the prize in October in Iowa, a Midwestern U.S. state where farming is the mainstay of the economy. Maria Magalu, VOA News, Washington. It's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. Apple's iPhone reaches a major milestone. We'll be right back.
And welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Bile refugee camp in eastern Cameroon had a population of 5,000, which swelled to more than 16,000 between 2012 and 2014, as thousands of refugees fleeing violence in Central African Republic found shelter in the village. Using energy saving stoves that use briquettes made from sawdust and other wastes is helping to ease tensions between refugees and locals over increasingly scarce wood in the area. Although the new stoves made by the refugees were initially designed for the refugees, local residents have also embraced them. Bile now has 10 centers, making the fuel five in the refugee camp and five in the village, each producing 8,000 briquettes per day. Nearly 70% of Bile's population no longer searches for wood in the bush. And finally, Apple Inc.'s iPhone turns 10 Thursday. Some may not remember that the device that ended up doing most of this, the start, the smartphone revolution, got off to a rocky start. The very concept of the iPhone came as a surprise to some of Apple's suppliers a decade ago, even though Apple, led by CEO Steve Jobs, had already expanded beyond computers with the iPod. Apple has sold more than 1 billion iPhones since June 29, 2007, but the first iPhone, which launched without an App Store, was restricted to the AT&T network, was limited to compared to today's version. And that's what's trending today. A South Sudan girls-only sports club is helping to promote peace between communities in a country which is divided by conflict. Female students from schools around the city of Ye in South Sudan spend their free time discovering new talents. The Spring for Peace organization aims to promote peace among young girls and teaches students to learn and appreciate other communities as they engage in sports and games. Girls at the club are encouraged to focus on the education they are taught how to deal with trauma and other challenges caused by the ongoing war. The club also seeks to discourage child marriage that could deprive girls of, a, of an education and hinder their development. Parents don't force your children to marriage. We girls, we have a future, we have dreams, we have hopes in this life. Sometimes people say girls just a waste of time, they're just a waste of resources, but that's not true. We're also human beings, the same rights with boys, and sometimes you may find, like in my class, girls are leading. The club is supported by the UN mission in South Sudan. Spring for Peace currently works with girls, but plans are in place to introduce a similar club for boys. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC, and in the mornings to Daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks for watching, and a very good night from Washington. Welcome to English in a Minute. A fly is an insect with wings. They are very small and hard to notice. But why would a person want to be a fly on the wall? Let's listen. Fly on the wall. My roommate was breaking up with her boyfriend. Oh no, that's too bad. Were they talking really loudly? 